Good morning. Uh, Revelation 3, if you want to turn there, we'll read from Revelation 3 in just a moment. But have you ever been in a relationship where uh, maybe you are feeling good about things, you're wanting to, to take things to the next level, uh, but this other person just doesn't want to go there with you? Um, normally we think of that in terms of like romantic relationships, right? You can imagine the, the high school or college boy who is just so in love with this girl and so he begins to do all these things to try to win over her affection. But as time goes on, all of his acts of service and gift giving or whatever else pu- proves to be futile and he just can't do anything to win over her love. Now, it's not just romantic relationships. It could be other things, right? You could maybe think of uh, as siblings. Maybe you grew up and uh, you did a lot of fighting as kids. And maybe there were times through those teenage years that were tentious. Maybe there was a difference in maturity level that caused y'all to just have this sort of friction in your relationship. But eventually, as you got older, you got to a point where you started to desire their their love and their friendship. But as you tried to reach out to this sibling, they seem to have their own friends now and their own life, and they didn't desire that same connection that that you wanted. And you just can't seem to to take things to that more meaningful, more intimate level, even just with a, a, a brother or a sister. Or maybe you're a parent. And, and you, you tried your best. Maybe you were a, a great parent, but still through those teenage years, there were times where it was just hard for you to, to really connect. And then they grew up into adulthood and they began to pursue their own life and career and family. And maybe they moved many miles away. And what you want is more than just a card on Christmas. What you want is more than just a a visit at Thanksgiving or from time to time or a call on your birthday. What you want is a a meaningful relationship where there's connectedness and and openness and and you're sharing about life. And, And no matter how many times you try to reach out, it just doesn't seem to be reciprocated. And something's missing. And there's other situations, friendships can be like that, or maybe from a a child's perspective, a relationship with your mom and dad could be like that. Maybe the most difficult one that I could imagine would be in a marriage. At one time, things were were great, vibrant, thriving, a relationship full of of openness and, and trust and transparency. And because of that level of connection, there was so much joy and and wonder. But then, maybe nothing bad happened, but just life happened. Work happened, kids happened, and and all of a sudden you look up one day and you've realized you've drifted pretty far apart. And there's this distance, there's this disconnection And maybe you try to bridge that gap. Maybe you try to reach out and and you try to get that connectedness back, that intimacy back. You try to take that relationship to a deeper level, back to the way things were, or maybe even better than the way things were. But no matter what you do, it it just seems like you can't convince them to, to show the same. And that can lead to a lot of, of hardship and, and it can be so tough and challenging. And, and I think we all know to some degree what, what that's like. With, with some relationship, with some person that you love, at some point in your life, you've probably desired things to be taken to a deeper level than they were. And for whatever reason, that person just wouldn't go there with you. Maybe they just became complacent with the way things are. Now, I want you to imagine this. What what if, what if God desires to take things to the next level in his relationship with you? 
What if God desires to take things to that next level and for whatever reason, that's not being reciprocated? I think we read something about that here in Revelation chapter 3. And before we read, in in Revelation 2 and 3, it's really interesting. We read these seven letters that are written to the churches uh, in Asia Minor. Now, this isn't uh, the Asia that we typically think of today. This is in and around the Mediterranean. Uh, Think Greece. Um, and he writes these, uh, th- these, these letters are written, but they're not just written from anyone. They're written from Jesus himself. And from time to time, we read letters at the end of our services and uh, in the announcements, letters from different people. And sometimes we're more locked in than others. But imagine if we got a letter written from Jesus, we would probably be pretty locked in. We'd be pretty focused, hanging on every word. And I think that's how these letters would have been heard. They would have been locked in. And here's here's what Jesus says. Here's what Jesus writes to one of these seven churches. In verse 14, Revelation 3, 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. It says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For he says, you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now those are some pretty harsh words. Imagine if, if someone got up and, and read a letter saying, this is from Jesus. We have, we have absolute evidence. We know this is written from Jesus himself, and this is what we hear. That's pretty hard. Those are some harsh words that are spoken. And, and what, is, what is even going on? What does he mean? He's, he talks about spewing them out of his mouth and how they're wretched and, and pitiable and poor and blind. What does all this even mean? Um, did anyone drink coffee this morning by chance? You can raise your hand. Um, uh, some of you probably needed to. No, I'm just kidding. You all look great. You all look great. Um, right. I, I, everyone likes their coffee different, right? You know, some people go in and they say, you know, I want lo- lots of cream and sugar, right? Or some people go in and they've got like this 10 word long order. You know, I have the double mocha white cappuccino. I don't even know all the words. I always feel like nervous when I go to Starbucks because I don't know the lingo. Uh, but everybody orders it differently. Some people, right, they want, they want just a hot black coffee. Other people, they go for the cold brew, the iced coffee, whatever. Here's, here's, why, here's why I bring this up. Nobody walks in and says, yeah, yeah, you know, I, that, I'll, the, here's my order. And uh, if, you could just, if you could just make that room temperature, that'd be great. Like, oh, that'd be so, I've been craving this all day long. End of a long work day, like, I really could go for a lukewarm coffee. That'd be awesome. Like, nobody, nobody does that. Um, and here's, here's what Jesus is, is saying. This, I, I don't want a lukewarm relationship. I don't, I, I don't want this kind of relationship where it, we're just complacent, where we're just okay with the, the way things are. I don't want this distance. I don't want this disconnection. I don't want to become okay with this lack of, of, of intimacy and closeness and connection. And, and on one hand, that does still sound harsh, but think about it. It's not God, it's not Jesus coming in with this attitude of, of, of anger and frustration. He doesn't sound like an angry tyrant. He sounds like a wounded lover. And imagine if it were the other way, right? Imagine if, imagine if Jesus said, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually cool with that. Like, I'm actually great with the way things are. I'm, I'm totally fine with this distance. I'm totally fine that we don't have the zeal and the passion. I, I think that's pretty good. I think, I think I'm content with that. No, we would see that as, as, a, as a problem. And if we ever desired to know him more and more and more, and we, 
were knocking on the door and we couldn't get in, that would, that would be an even greater problem. And so while these words maybe initially sound harsh, the words are coming as this wounded lover that says, I, I want more than this. I want more than this. And he says, right, you say that you've prospered. You say that you've got all of these things. But the reality on the inside is things are not okay. And what he's critiquing is not their prosperity, is not their abundance. What he's critiquing is their spirit of self-sufficiency. And there may be nothing that causes more distance in a relationship then when this thought comes into the mind of one or the other or both that says, I don't really need you. Like, I've got it all figured out on my own. I, 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 I'm okay with, with part of you, but I've got things taken care of on my own. And what Jesus is coming in and saying is, I don't just want a part of you, I want all of you. And so Jesus says, I don't, I, I, I want you to be cold or hot, but I don't want this lukewarm love. And so verse 20 says this. He says, behold, look, I stand at the door and knock. Now think about that for a moment. In one chapter, we're going to see Revelation 4. We're not going to read it, but, but you would see Revelation 4. And it's this amazing scene where God is seated on the throne and there's flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and he's surrounded by the heavenly host. And it is a scene of power and might and majesty. What's he doing knocking on the door? Like, wh- why, why, doesn't, why doesn't God just barge in? It's his people after all. It's his church Why doesn't he just go in and demand this level of respect, demand this level of focus and attention? And I think what this scene communicates is is this. As he knocks, here's what he says. With all my might and all my power and all the things that I can do, there's one thing that I cannot do. There's one thing that I cannot do, and it's the one thing that I desire the most. I can make you serve me. I can make you obey me. I can make you fear me, but I cannot make you love me. I cannot make you love me. And throughout scripture, this is the picture we see of God. He's the loving father who desperately longs for his prodigal son to to come home. He's the loyal friend who seeks reconciliation and recommitment even after he's been forsaken and betrayed. He's the wounded lover who relentlessly pursues his bride time and time again after she's been unfaithful. And even from the very beginning as Adam and Eve sin and they hide out in the trees of the garden, what do we see God doing in that moment? He's walking around in the cool of the day, almost, almost as if he was right on time for their walk. And in this sort of heartbreaking scene, he says, where are you? Where are you? And what God wants all throughout the Bible story, this whole time what he's pursuing is this love. He says, love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And so we get to the end of the Bible and God's desire is still the same. Here Jesus is standing outside of a church that has fallen into this lukewarm love and he's knocking. And he says, I I want in. And I want into not just this lukewarm relationship, but a relationship that's characterized by intimacy. 
And the problem that we find time and time again with humanity, with Israel, with the church, and with this church right here in Revelation is we tend to trade intimacy for complacency. Um, we trade intimacy for this lack of, of, of zeal, for this lack of, of wonder and appreciation. Um, and here's, here's an example of how I think this sometimes hits us. I, I, I debated whether or not to share this, but um, I, I had an amazing conversation on Friday with Brother Ray Pringle, who's here from South Africa. And I loved hearing um, his excitement to come here and, and, and be here this morning talking about how awesome it would be to walk through these doors and get to sing with five, six hundred people. And I could hear the, the excitement and wonder about that. And, and I want to know, do, do you feel that? Like, ha, have you just become complacent with that? I, I was struck by that. I was convicted by that. It felt like, do I have the same excitement and wonder to come here? Do I have the same excitement and wonder that the God of the universe, the only, only the holy God that we just sang about, actually desires to have a relationship with me, actually took on flesh and died for me so that he could win my heart and be in a relationship with me? Do I have the same wonder? I don't know that I always do. I trade that intimacy for just this complacency, and it's so easy to do. heard a quote one time that said, if the devil can't take you away from a relationship with God, he'll make you settle for a lesser version of it. I think there's something really true about that. And I'm not here to guilt anyone in their relationship with God. This is, this is always something, right? We can always come closer in. Jesus is always calling us to draw nearer and nearer and nearer. But I want to ask this as we close. What's the solution? Maybe you're thinking, yeah, that is me. I do feel complacent. I, I have lost that fire. I have lost this zeal and love and passion for God. And so how, how do I fix that? Well, I think this is so powerful what, what Jesus says next in verse 20. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And then verse 20, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and tell you all your wrongs. I will come in and yell at you for not loving me the way that you should. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I will come in to him and I'll eat with him and he with me. Okay, so what's, what's the solution? He says, if you hear my voice, and maybe you hear that voice this morning, maybe you hear Jesus calling you closer in, maybe you hear that knock, and it is, might be a little bit painful. He says, if you hear that voice, then open the door. And maybe it's not just one door that needs to be opened. Maybe our life is something like this, layers and layers of doors or walls that we put up that we constantly need to break down to allow Christ to come closer and closer in. But he says, open that door. And then he says, and I'll share this meal with you. I'll share this meal with you. And what does that mean? Um, for those of you who are married in here, I, I, I don't have experience with this, but I can imagine something like this, right? That, things ever just get busy Chores, kids, work, things pile up and, and you do feel that, that distance at some point. But then you finally get that date night again and, and you share that meal together and it's this undistracted time where you're locked in and, and you're focused and you can just be with one another. I think that's what Jesus is calling us to here. Right? Just, just come and, and, and be undistracted. Come and, and let's give our attention to, to one another again. And let's have this openness and this transparency and this love. 
And while I think what Jesus says here is more than just about the Lord's Supper, here's what I want us to see. Every week is an opportunity to share in this meal that Jesus is inviting us to. And if we've become distracted, if we've become distant, if we've grown apathetic, this meal is an invitation to recommit and to refocus and to to renew ourselves in this intimacy, to recommit our love to the one who gave his life for us. And rather than settling for complacency, every week is an opportunity to seek a deeper and deeper intimacy with God, to reset our week, to reset our minds, and allow him to come in. And in this meal, Jesus doesn't offer bread and wine. In this meal, Jesus offers himself. And so I want to close with the words of the psalmist in Psalm 24, in light of what we just read here in Revelation 3, that I hope will be powerful as we partake. Psalm 24 and verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. The king of glory is knocking. Will you lift up your gates? Will you open the door? Will you let the king of glory in? At this time, we'll now ask the men to come forward as we partake.